So Lord, we come before you right now with an opportunity in front of us to stop and to hold on to, think about, God, what you have in store for us. God, I pray that as we process and plan and allow the things around us to wash away, to rid ourselves of the distractions. God, I pray that each and every one of us would just fall into this place of your presence. That as you work your way around this room, that we would invite you in to do a work that so desperately needs to be done. God, I pray that we would be humble enough to each admit that we have a place, that we have an area in our lives that needs work, and that in this moment, we would invite you to, to take hold of that and to start that healing process, and that nobody here would think, I've got it all under control, I know what's happening, I'm good, but God, that we would stop holding on so tight, and we would let go and allow you to work. God, I pray for a spirit of conviction, not only for those sitting in the seats, but for myself too as I stand here and pray and preach. God, help us all to have that desire to grow right now and to not miss the opportunity to meet with you in a way that we've never met you before. So, Lord, work, change, break us down so you can build us back up. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. We do it all because of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did upon the cross for us. And in his name, we say, amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Welcome to Impact Church. My name is Mike, and I am grateful that you are with us on this Sunday morning. And I'm excited as we continue to uh, go through this series, uh, Why Are We Here? And uh, we're in the second chapter of the book of Acts. So what I want you to do is go ahead and open up your Bibles to that, Acts chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand, and we will put a Bible in your hands, and then you can take that home as a gift from us to you. But we want you in the Word of God, Acts chapter 2. And then we also want you to reach into your program and grab your notes. They look like these. And these are going to help you follow along today as we're diving into uh, this second to last um, message in this series, Why Are We Here? And today we're talking about the walls of the church. So while you're looking for that, Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament, I'm going to give you just a brief run-in on um, this, uh, this series and what we've been talking about. And you know, it's the, basically the, the big idea to, to this whole series, Why Are We Here? is, is what is Sunday morning to you? Like, what is church to you? Too often we go through life and we, we do these things in our lives and we don't actually have a reason as to why we're doing them. We're not purposeful in our execution. You know, we all have, uh, if you either have a kid or you know a kid or you've been around a kid, uh, we all have this understanding that when a kid does something and you look at them and you say, why would you do that? What is their response more often than not? I don't know. And they say, I don't know. And you look at them and say, well, why would you do it if you don't know why you did it? And we are guilty to do this as adults as well. Uh, we sit in these chairs on a Sunday morning and we say, well, why are you here today? I don't know. What's the point? What's the purpose? What is the opportunity that's in front of you uh, when you sit in these seats, when you look at what God has established in the church, found in Acts chapter 2, and when we understand what that is, now we can actually have purpose in our lives and purpose for why we're here. And we're not just wasting a Sunday. God wants us to be living this life on purpose. So we have to ask ourselves, are we doing that? Are we giving uh, ourselves up for the opportunity of purpose in the church that God established for a purpose. So we need to answer that question for ourselves. And we've been talking about these things. So turn in your notes, Acts chapter 2, page 1 in your notes. <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to read 42 to 47, 
And then we're going to dive into the first half of 47 is what we're breaking down today together. So Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, it says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. 45, they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. 47, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So the key verse that we're focusing in on here is the first part of verse 47. It says, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Now, before we break that verse down, I want to just do a quick review or understanding of what this series has dug into thus far and why we're answering this question, why are we here Week one, we talked about this idea of the purpose of the church, right? And we learned that God established the church in Acts chapter 2 for four reasons, right? To learn, for fellowship, for encouragement, and for prayer. But the catch there isn't just that he created it for that reason, but that we actually have to devote ourselves to that. So devoting ourselves to the learning, to the fellowship, to the encouragement, to the prayer is what God desires for us to do. That's the purpose of of the church. And when you devote yourself, meaning you put everything that you have into that purpose, now things are going to start shifting in your lives. And we found out in verse 43 that because they were devoting themselves, that then they were being overcome with this deep sense of awe of God. And when they did that, not only was it transforming their lives, but it started to affect those around them as well. So they had this deep sense and it was directing their hearts and minds towards God. And then their lives were impacting those around them. But it started with the devotion part. They were devoted to God, to the learning, to the fellowship, to the encouragement, to the prayer. And then because of that devotion, they found themselves in awe of him, which was changing their heart, which then brings them to the community of the church, which we find in verse 44. And they started gathering as one and they were being sold out for the cause, living this life together outside of just Sundays and then going to the next level in their lives, just as God desired for them to do. So it starts with one, you devote, and then you find yourself in awe of, and then your life goes to this next level of of opportunities to serve and understanding of who he is and transformation of your heart. And all of this happens in order. And if you skip any of it, then you're not going to end up on the end result, which is what we're all hoping for, the purpose, why God originally created the church, which was to change people's lives. And when you can find yourself in awe of him, and you, because you are devoted to him, then everything starts to change. And that's what he wants for us. That's why he made the church. And then when we realize the purpose, when we have that understanding of our, our health in the church and then the community of the church, now we then get to see the church is being built. What happens inside these walls? Right now that we understand what the church can be for us, what's actually happening in the walls of the church when you get to that point. Again, you can't can't experience and then gain from what we're about to talk about if we're not focusing on and devoting ourselves to and finding ourselves in awe of who God really is. That's what they had to do. And I'm going to be referencing this the entire time as we continue to go through this series. But as we focus in on the walls of the church, we see that in the walls of the church, right, 47, all while praising God, enjoying the goodwill of all these people, number one, it's a place of common praise. It's a place of common praise. So we see that the reason why it's a place of common praise is because we're all on the same page, 
right? I devoted myself to it. I found myself in awe of God, and so did everybody else around me because what was happening in my life was transforming me, and then all of the, it was overflowing to all these people around me as well, and because that was happening, now other lives were changing, including the lives that we're here together with on a Sunday, and we're in this common place, not only in the church, but in our faith as well, and we're growing together, and because we are in this common place of praise, everything means more. Like there's no place else in your week that you're going to come together and you are going to be able to praise God, find yourself in awe of God than at the church. Like it just isn't going to happen on this level anywhere else in your week. Now you can still have opportunities to find yourself in awe of God throughout the week, but nothing like when you're doing this together. Like when you turn around and you see all these people praising God together, it's just, it's more. It's encouraging. It's comforting. It's an amazing thing to, to be together and to all have this in common. Now, like I said, you can find other opportunities in your week to praise God and to be in awe of Him. Like I might be at home and I'll be sitting there reading and I'll look out in my living room and I'll see like the dozens of kids that I have and I'm just looking at them and I just go, man, God, you're good. God, you're so good. And I find myself in awe of Him. Even as we were singing that song, and we were talking about, I don't know how this, like, I'm walking around these walls. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't get it, but you've been faithful before. You're going to be faithful again. How do I get through this? I instantly started thinking of Becca and I's life and how we so wanted kids in a big family. And things just kept on going the wrong direction. And we just felt like we were walking around, walking around. And we couldn't get what it was that we felt like we wanted so badly. And as, as long as we continued to be faithful for, to God, he eventually kept answering those prayers, right? And then we get our, our baby girl, and she grows up, and now she's an annoying 13-year-old or almost 13-year-old. Praise God. And they're like, well, we want more than just one. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm holding him as we're praising. And, and, and then I see it, right? God's so, he's like, I told you I was going to take I'm going to fill it up. I'm going to fill you up. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to, I'm going to make it so that something you never saw coming. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six. And be like, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> you know, and this is what God does. This is how he fills you up. I don't know how, but I know that when I'm, when I'm, when I'm in awe of God, everything around me changes. And to be in awe of God together in that common place of praise. It's unlike anything we can experience anywhere else in our lives. Psalm 150, it says, praise the Lord. I love how that's like, that's the sentence. Praise the Lord. It's gonna start right there. Praise the Lord. Okay, praise God, what? In his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. So we're not just waiting for some day to go up to heaven to praise God. He says, do it right now, where you are, right here. Praise him for, okay, what are we supposed to be praising him for? His mighty works. Praise him for his unequaled greatness. Praise him with a blast of a ram's horn. I love it. You know what that means? Like, be loud about it. Be loud about your praise to him. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Oh, that means you can also be quiet about it. We got some loud folks. We got some quiet folks. That's okay. Praise him with the ram's horn, maybe with the harp. Praise him with a tambourine. And check this out, with dancing. Get obnoxious about it. Praise him with the strings and the flutes. Praise him with the clash of the cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Put everything you have into it. Just go after it. All right? Six, let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. And then it ends the same way it started. Praise the Lord. Like, this is where it should start. This is where it should end. Everything else in between, just give it all that you have. Praise the Lord. And he says everybody should be doing this. You know, in this environment that we have here at the church, that allows that to happen unlike any other place in our lives. Take advantage of that. Look at that. Take it in. Because it only happens every once in a while. And that's an opportunity that the church gives us inside of these walls to have a place of common praise. Well, you might say, well, it's not really me. Like, I'm not really that loud, rambunctious person. Well, you can be the quiet little harp then. 
But just whatever it is, wherever you are, whoever, just give it. And listen, the other catch to this whole thing is, too, I don't care how you praise, just do it. Like, I've seen people praising with arms up. I see people praising quietly, just praying. But you've got to decide to do that for yourself. Like, where you sit, whatever that looks like for you. But if you're not sitting there in a place of praising God, of being in awe of Him, then you need to figure out why. Like, why are you not praising God? Why are you not in awe of Him? I don't know what that answer is for you. All I know what the answer is for me, and I am in awe of God. So I'm heading in the right direction, but why are you not in awe of God? you got to answer that yourself, and then figure it out, and then start moving in that direction. So that way you can be in this common place of praise and enjoy that that much more. Within that common place of praise, we also see that all the while praising God and what? Enjoying. There's a place of authentic joy. That's what this is, a place with authentic joy. You know, here at Impact, I'm all about the authenticity of our lives. Be authentic in your faith. Be authentic as a person. Be authentic as a parent, as a friend, as a spouse. Like, be authentic so that way you can continue. So I don't care if you're loud, if you're quiet, right? If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're standing still, if you're dancing, if you're praising, if you're praying, I don't care. Just be authentic in what it is that you're doing right now, right? You want to hop, skip, and jump? Have at it. But just praise Him and be authentic within that praise. Go after it with everything that you have. Right? Remember what it said there and in, in what we just read? It says that with everything, Psalm 150, everything that has breath, so that includes every single person here, should be finding their praise, their authentic praise with God. So don't miss that. Don't skip that. Don't, don't miss out on what that could look like in your life. But we need to be authentic within that praise, within that, that um, opportunity that God has given to us. 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, which is what? Jesus Christ. See, there's the why. Like, there's how we get to this place of authentic praise. I took a little line, I put it between the words foundation and Jesus Christ. There's a connection there. Because of Jesus Christ and because he is my foundation, now I can find myself in this moment of praise unlike any place else, right? Authentic, real praise because I understand who Jesus is. How do I understand who Jesus is? Because I found myself in awe of him. How did I find myself in awe of him? Because I devoted myself to what? The learning, the fellowship, the encouragement, and the prayer. And that drove me to this new place where I was in awe of him. I found this authentic. I, it literally says that I'm praising God and I'm enjoying it. How many of your kids looking and say, I can't wait to go to church? I'm hoping that a lot of them say that about this place. I didn't say it too often when I was a kid. But man, that's what we should want. Like I, I, don't, I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. I want to go to church. And it's not because it's the church, it's because it's the people that are here. And everything that's happening around me here is just overwhelming and I love it. Because the purpose of the church is being fulfilled. Why are we here? Well, that foundation is built upon. I've devoted myself to it. I'm authentic in it. And now I want more of it. That's what this is about. And we can have that. You can come to a place of common praise, and then you can find this place of authentic joy. And here's the hard part. You can have that authentic joy even when it's really, really, really hard. Even when it seems completely unfair. Why? Because it's real joy. Remember, the Bible doesn't, doesn't promise you happiness, rainbows and unicorns and fluffy things. It promises you joy. Everlasting and unending that's what you can get. And joy surpasses the situation. Joy takes us beyond the circumstance. And that's what we have to focus on. That's why it's so much more valuable and, worth, and worthy of praise. Not just happiness, because happiness is fleeting. But I can have an authentic joy? Yes. In these walls. I'm not just saying it's like, it's not like these, it's, it's what God has established as the church, as the body, as our body, as who we are. You can have that, but you got to be here, all right? 
The place, common praise, a place with authentic joy. And then it's also a place of goodwill and support for each other. All the while praising God and enjoying what? The goodwill of the people. A place of goodwill and support for each other. You know, when I was thinking as I was trying to put like examples down, right? Because we all like examples to relate to. I just started thinking through this church and what this church does when it comes to the goodwill. So we came out yesterday and we had that coat drive. I mean, you should have seen it. It was incredible. And I was so proud to be the pastor of this church. I mean, it was, I mean, the line out to the parking lot of people that were coming here because we were trying to serve them out of goodwill, out of authentic joy and care. Like we were really, we were here, we were in it. And people were coming. You know, we have an opportunity this afternoon to support a family that's grieving a loss. And we get to come together. And I'm so proud of this church and how they've come around this family that does I mean, she and her granddaughter come here, but the rest of this family doesn't know anything about us. And we're going to come alongside and we are going to celebrate this woman's life because she loved this church. And I'm so proud of the people that are coming alongside and supporting, comforting. That's what this is about. And when you're a part of this, when you're in this, you get to be a part of that and everything changes because your heart is transformed into a different direction where it's not just about me and what's happening in my life. It's about everything that God is doing in our lives right now. And that is something that excites me. Why? Because it's authentic. It's real. It's amazing. And I get to be a part of that, that goodwill and that support to help those that need it. Now, we're not perfect. I get that. But man, we are so wanting to be there for people. We have, we have the opportunity to praise God within our service. Ephesians 4.2, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each Allowance for each other's faults. Doesn't that all sound really easy to do, right? Humbleness, gentleness, patience, forgiveness. Isn't that easy? No? I can't tell. Brights are too, lights are too bright right now. Is that easy? No, it's not easy. It's not easy at all to be those things. But he gives us the how we can be. We can allow for the other's faults because of what? Your love. It's authentic. It's real. And it's so much easier to love other people, especially those that we have to forgive or have patience with or allow faults of or be humble around when we're in this common place to do it together. Because they are, because you know what? It's not all about this circumstance. It's about, hey, how are we going to lift this circumstance up out of the mud? What are we going to do and how are we going to do this together? That's what the local church is doing it together. And it's so much easier when you're together in it. And we're doing it because what? We have this commonality of what? The love of God. And because we are common, we have that commonality there, now we can do it easier. We enjoy it. We come together with it, and everything becomes easier. It's a place of goodwill and support for each other. And it's all that because we have this real opportunity, number four, a place where people will become your people. The praising, the, the enjoyment, the goodwill of all the people. And this is a place where you can come and the people will become your people. How many of you guys have people? You have people. If you have people, raise your hand. You got people? If you have a spouse, you should have your hand raised up right now because you have a people, Okay. <laughs> We have people. We have people in our lives. And when you come together, you can grow that group of people in your lives that will completely change who you are and what you're doing and the purpose that you have and where you're going and how you're getting there. It can shift everything. Because the, these people that are here, why? Because we have this common understanding of praise because we are all in awe of God because we have all devoted ourselves to him and because of that now this is more than just showing up and sitting next to somebody I'm sitting with my family 
I'm sitting with the people that are going to be with me through the, through the hard times. They're going to celebrate the good times. They're going to lift me up. They're going to help. It's going to be so much more. That's what the walls of this church allow us to have. Right? It becomes this home to us. And again, there's no other place that you can get that outside of the local church, not on that level. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Here's that praise again. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Don't miss that. The source of the comfort. Like, you're coming to church because you want comfort. You need comfort. Or you're looking for comfort. Well, how are we, and, and, and maybe we want to give comfort. How can we do that if we are outside of the place where you get the comfort? Like, we get the comfort from the source who is God, and because we have that, why? Because, again, we have this commonality, because we're in awe, because we devoted ourselves to it, and now we can give that comfort because we have a direct tap into the source of who He is. Why do we need that? He comforts us in our trouble so, circle it, so that we can comfort others. The reason why we need the comfort is so that we can give comfort. When they are troubled we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Why? Because you're my people. That's what it comes down to. Now we have those people in our lives. Five, for the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for our, your comfort and salvation. Right? Right? You could be sitting in the pain because he wants you to come and meet with the people that are going to show you who he is by their authentic love and their commonality of praise. And you need that. And you don't know you need that because we're buried in our pain. And when we come with these walls, when we're sitting here together, you can sit there and say, man, that's what I want too. How did you get through those six miscarriages? How did you get through the loss of a loved one? How did you get through that pain of a, of a job loss or, 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 or a breakup or, or this grief that you have in your life? How? I know Jesus. And they know Jesus. And they know Jesus. And they know Jesus. And all of us come together and we move forward with purpose. And they become my people. So even when I'm weighed down with these things, it's for my comfort, for my possible salvation, for when we ourselves are, confront, are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident. I love it. Confident. I know. I can walk in this with a surety. I am confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. So he keeps on taking us places. And this is the place to be. This is the place to find it. Back page your notes. And when we get to that place, right? When we finally find ourselves in that opportunity, right? Because I devoted to the learning, to the fellowship, to the encouragement, to the prayer. Because of that, man, I found this God, and he is amazing, and I am in awe of him. And because I am in awe of my God, my heart is changing. It's transforming. And when that person annoyed me, now I love them. When I needed to forgive him, it's a lot easier now. When I get impatient, I can, I can come around and say, you know what? I know you're hurting. I hurt too. Let me tell you how God got me out of it. And now everything is changing and my heart is shifting. And now we're coming together as one and we're doing it together because all of our lives are changing at the same time and we can't even comprehend it. It's just so authentic and so real. And now I want so many other people to be a part of it because if I love it that much, why shouldn't I share it? Why shouldn't I want more people to experience this as well? So that when they come in and they're buried in pain, I can come along and say, I know what it's like, I've been there. And the comforter, he comforted me. Let me tell you how. Let me show you what happened. Let me share with you my experiences. 
And then number five, that place, it sets us up for what's next in our lives. Right? Now we can see what's going to happen next. And like that's exciting. I already know what's going to happen next. You got to come back next week to figure it out. Or you can just read it at your house and you'll see it there. But everybody's going to start being added to the church. And lives are going to start changing. And I'm, I'm a part of it. I get to see. And you see, that's like the biggest joy that I could have as a pastor. Like, I'm, I'm, like I love being here on a Sunday. Love it. And it's not just because I get to enjoy the praise and worship or I get to enjoy, you know, the fellowship in the lobby or I get to talk to people, I get to pray with people. It's because I get to see Jesus change your life. Like you as an individual. Like I'm super pumped that these seats are getting more full all the time. It's amazing. It's awesome. But that means nothing if Jesus is not there with you. And I want to see lives changed for Jesus. Like that's that's it. Like, that's the, and I know, like, I don't have to need anything more than that, because as soon as he changes your life, then you're just going to come on board with what we're doing, because you're in awe of it, and you're devoted to it, and it's overwhelming to you, and you want more people to be a part of it, so you just keep going, and it's amazing. So what's your next step? What are you going to do? All right, it's time to take those steps in your faith. I love Acts twenty two sixteen. It says, what are you waiting for? Right, this is the same book, right? Acts chapter 2 is what we're reading now. Acts chapter 22 is coming. I don't know how long, I don't know what the distance is, the time frame between those two. But at some point he says, now that I've told you these things, and one of the things I told you was that this is what the church is, and this is why it's established, and this is what you can get out of it. Now get up and do something. What are you waiting for? It says, get up and be baptized. Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. You know what that means, get up and be baptized? What do we say baptism is here? Right? It's an outward reflection of an inward connection. So you're telling somebody. You're, and you're getting up and you're being vocal and you're moving out of your seat and you're going after what it is that God has for you next. That's what he's asking. That's what he's saying. He's saying, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do with what it is that I've shown you right now? How are you going to act this out? Maybe you need to get up and get baptized. We're doing baptisms next week, FYI. Maybe you need to get up and join the church. Maybe you need to go before somebody and say, will you forgive me? Maybe you need to go before someone and say, I forgive you. I don't know what it is that you have to do. I don't know what part of the community you need to try and come up alongside of it and, and get yourself ingrained to. But you've got to do something. And that's what I was praying earlier. Like when we first started, I was like, God, I know every single person in here has something that they could do. Like none of us have it all figured out. And if you have it all figured out, that's what you need to figure out because you're wrong, right? So we all have something we have to do. Now, what is it going to be? What's your next step? Like how are we diving after? This is your challenge, right? Are you ready and are you excited for what's next? And do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to be a part of it? Because I can promise you, it's awesome. It's so good. And we're seeing it. Like, we're, we're literally seeing it lived out right now. Like yesterday, we saw it lived out at the coat drive. This afternoon, we're going to see it lived out again. And tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. Why? Because in these walls, it's different. It's authentic, it's real, it's powerful. We have this commonality that is shifting this community and our lives and our families and our marriages. And you get to be a part of that if you want. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. I bet a majority of you guys have seen that verse before. And it should be really encouraging knowing that God has a plan for you. But here's the catch. That was written in Jeremiah, right? Pen down then. That was before the establishment of the church. And now God has established the church, and he's made exactly what he promised that much easier to find. Because you can come here, you can be a part of it, you can see what God is doing. 
get plugged in quicker, grow quicker, get after it quicker, and be, be with somebody while you do it. You're going to find some people in this church you relate to, I promise you. We're a melting pot of experiences. But it's amazing. But none of it matters to you. It all matters to me because I'm in it. I mean, I'm swimming around in it. It's awesome. But it's not going to matter to you if you don't get in it, if you're not a part of it, if you're not diving into it. And there's so many benefits from it. And we've been talking about all those things for the last several weeks. So do something about it, right? Acts 22, what are you waiting for? He's made the process easier. Now we have to go after it. But you've got to take a step. These four verses that we talk about every single week, all right, I, I, have, I have multiple goals for these. One is that I hope you memorize them. Because if you memorize these four verses, that's why we do a different blank every single week. So if you memorize all four of these verses, you can share the gospel with anybody with these four verses. So that's goal one. Goal two is that if there's somebody sitting here today that doesn't know Jesus, I want you to know Jesus today. Maybe that should be the first one. The other one should be the second one. I don't know. Either one, same thing. 1A, 1B. And the other goal is that if you're sitting there today and you know these verses, I want you to understand the weight of them and to think about them. Because you could be saved. You could be already in that relationship with the Lord, healthy, unhealthy, in between. I don't know. But these verses can continuously speak to your, your health, your growth. So what are you going to do with them? Isaiah 59, 2, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. If you don't know Jesus, this is the reason why we're having this division with God. Okay? Sins have cut us off. God is perfect. Sins make us imperfect. And he desires for us to be in a relationship with him. These sins cut us off. We can deal with that, though. If you're saved and you're sitting there right now, Sins can still creep up in your lives and they can put this divide between you. Not that God isn't, that you lose your salvation or God isn't going to still be there to protect you, but you now you're missing out on the blessings that God wants to pour upon your life because you put this thing in front of him, this sin in front of him, and it's dividing you. You need to deal with the sin. I don't know what your sin is. You got to deal with it. Romans 3.23, right? For everyone is sin, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Right? We all have this sin problem. Unsaved, saved, we still have the sin problem. So you need to think about it and deal with it. Figure out what is going on in your life that you need to confess, that you need to deal with. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of that sin is death. Remember we talked about last week? We get so caught up in the value of things, and the value of something tells us how important it should be in our lives. Right? So we sit there and say, gallon of milk, that much? Holy cow, I don't need it. Or we might sit there and say, man, that right there, the wages, the payment for that is death? Why is that price so high? I need to explore that. I need to understand that. I need to accept that free gift. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The free gift. Who likes free stuff? That's the reality of it. We get, he paid the, the value. I'm not going to pay that much for a gallon of milk, but I'm going to ignore something that costs death to pay for? Romans 10, if you want to accept that, if you openly declare that Jesus is, Lord, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That believe, you know what that believe is in your heart? That's being in awe of God. Like, I believe it so much that I'm overwhelmed and I can't comprehend it and I can't put it in a box. And sometimes it's even hard to put words to it because it's just overwhelming. And when I understand that, when I believe in my heart that he loved me so much that he died on the cross for me, that he paid that price that nobody else could pay for me, that he did it so that way I could be in eternity with him one day. As annoying as I am, he still wants me there. Like that is unbelievable. That is overwhelming. That is something I want. And then when I get that, he's going to put me in this, this family, this community of like-minded brothers and sisters 
that I get to then have purpose in my life for the now. Listen, I'm so excited about heaven one day. Eternity future. Riding dinosaurs, tables full of food, football in the backyard. It's going to be awesome. But I don't want to miss out on the now. I'm pretty convinced I'm about halfway through my life at this point. I have like a, a big birthday coming up this year and I'm trying to ignore it. I don't want to waste any more time because this is blah, what we have here, what you can be a part of. It's unbelievable in the walls of the church. So what are you going to do next, friend? What's your decision going to be? What step are you going to take? Hey, what do you need help with? How can I come alongside of you? How can we come alongside of you? How can we lift up your arms? How can we pray for you? How can we care for you? What can we make for you? Where can I take you? I don't know. But be a part of this. And I promise you, your life will change. So God, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you and we desire you. And God, I ask that as each and every one of us take a moment to be honest with ourselves about what it is that you're going to do or can do or want to do, that we would stop and we would open ourselves up to that possibility. And we would not let anything around us distract us from the chance that we have to get right with you today and for whatever reason we've been ignoring it or maybe we didn't even know about it because we're sitting here right now we're saying God search my heart point out to me what I need to change maybe we should all say that, say that prayer together God search my heart and point out to me anything that is keeping me from growing closer to you and Lord, give us the ability to humble ourselves, put a conviction in our hearts that move us, shakes us, breaks us. And then may we have a heart of humility to come before you and to make you the foundation of our lives to build us back up. God, I thank you for this community, for this house of worship. But Lord, I thank you for even more so this family of believers that authentically love. And I praise you, God, for letting me be a part of it. God, I pray if there is anybody here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that you would press it on their hearts right now to make this decision. Not force, but just open their minds to it, God. What does it mean? What does it look like? What, how could it change them? Friend, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer right now, where you sit, where you watch, where you listen. It's a decision that you're making to put him at the forefront of your life, understanding what he's paid for, why he paid for it, why you need it. Say something like this where you're at. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that sin separates me from you. I know that sin separates me from God. And right now, I want to ask you to forgive me of those sins. I'm sorry. I want to ask you to come into my heart today, to save me today. To become the leader of my life. I believe that you love me so much that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you love me so much that you came back from the grave for me. And I want to make you the leader of my life. I want to make you the king of my heart. I want you to direct me from this day forward. God, I thank you for who you are, for how much you love me. I'm excited about where you're taking me. Surround me with the help that I need to get there. Lord, and help me to be an encouragement to those around me that may need it because I've gone through what they are going through now. 
Lord, I thank you for the fact that I know you're here. I know you're moving around this room. I know that you're touching hearts and minds. I know that there's somebody in this room right now, if not more than one, that is battling something. So Lord, help them to give it up today. Help us to be that support system they need to give it up today. Help us all, Lord, to go after you with everything we have because you came after us with everything that you are. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. We do it all because of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did upon the cross for us. And in his name we pray, amen.